Marshall, your chaperone at these arcane revels, which are celebrated here seven times each week. There's the smile of love and the smile of deceit and the smile of smiles where both smiles meet. Why are love and deceit so often found together? Must we deceive to love or do we love to deceive? But where you find love and deceit together, they do not usually remain alone. Often, this duet becomes a trio, and the third member turns out to be death. How do you render justice in your country? We have courts. Courts? Halls, where people assemble and we have judges, juries, lawyers. Ah, yes. Is it wise to allow people to judge people? It is the best way, the most democratic. Only the immortal gods may decide. But how do you know to get them to make a decision? The gods have sent my people a spring of sparkling water. The accused must drink at the spring. And what does that prove? The innocent walk away vindicated. And the guilty? The guilty fall down dead. Well, it is hardly the way. You will see it with your own eyes. We shall have a trial tonight. Oh? Who is the accused? You are. Our mystery drama, The Smile of Deceit, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Jennifer Harmon. The poet tells us that nothing succeeds like success. The question, therefore, arises, what is success? That depends on whom you ask. Inquire of the philosophers and you'll soon discover that uh, as a group, they tend to knock it. They say things like, success has always been a great liar. Or, the greatest success is an early death. That's all very well, but who among us would refuse to be successful? Who, if given free choice, would choose failure? Certainly not Miss Velma Strait. Women's lib to the contrary notwithstanding, success for many girls in our society still means the acquisition of a wealthy husband. And Velma, as we shall discover has hit a rather respectable jackpot. Just a minute, darling. Oh, it's Aunt Rose. Well, I see you were expecting darling. <laughs> I was. Well, may I come in? Of course, come in, Aunt Rose. By all means, come in. <laughs> well, aren't you glad to see me, Velma, dear? Well, you know I am. I, I just... Well, you said you didn't think that you could get away. Well, I really can't. But would it be right for you to graduate all alone, with no one to applaud? Besides, you said you're engaged, so I just had to. Come down and see if you approve. Oh, I shall approve. I know how I raise my little girl. I'm sure you chose a wonderful man. Oh, he is, Aunt Rose. Absolutely wonderful. Well, tell me all about him. Well, his name is Robert Morris Hastings III. Oh, that sounds impressive. Is he at school here? Oh, yes. And is he graduating, too? Oh, no. He's on the faculty. An instructor? A professor. Oh, that's marvelous. Dear, I wouldn't dare to suggest this. It's so presumptuous to advise the young, but I'd hope you'd choose a mature man. And I did. Oh, the young men today seem so unsettled, so, so uncertain. An older man is so much safer, so much more secure... And in many ways, more romantic. Now tell me everything about Robert Morris Hastings III. Well, you shall meet him in exactly one minute. 
Oh, I will. He promised to stop in and say hello on his way to the faculty assembly. He said he'd ring the bell at 11 o'clock, and he is the soul of promptness. Well, that's an excellent quality and a sign of good character. What does he teach? Anthropology. Oh, dearest, I am so happy for you. To be the wife of a professor. To live in the intellectually stimulating atmosphere of a university. Oh, well, we won't live here, Aunt Rose. Robert's resigning his post. He is? We're going out into the field. Robert's specialty is in psychic phenomena among primitive peoples. It's fascinating how the mind can be manipulated to produce, well, almost anything. Even death. Anyhow, starting next month, it'll be deserts and jungles. Well, will you look at the clock? Eleven exactly. Robert, darling, come in. I can only pause for a moment, my dear. Darling, the most wonderful human being in all the world is here to give us our blessing. Aunt Rose, this is Robert. Robert, Mrs. Maynard Gardner. But you'll have to call her Aunt Rose. How, how do you do? How I have looked forward to this occasion. Velma never stops talking about you, Aunt Rose. Well, let's all have some coffee. Oh, my dear, I don't have time. Darling, it only needs a minute to boil the water. Yes, but a cup of coffee right now would be too much. I already have had two at breakfast. Now, Robert, you promised to watch that. I know, my dear, and I do try. Oh, he's just terrible, Aunt Rose. I really should be going. But you just got here. I promised to pop in on my way to the assembly to say hello, and now I, I must pop out. I'll look for you both at the commencement exercises. Well, if you must go. And Aunt Rose, you will be our guest at luncheon. I, um, I, I should be getting back to the city. Nonsense. Of course you'll be our guest, Robert. I'll make a reservation for three at the Hamilton room. Goodbye, ladies. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye. <coughs> well? Velma. Isn't he marvelous? Are you serious? Uh... Are you saying you don't like Robert? How, how could you consider marriage with... Oh, with, with... I know. He's not as young as you might have expected. But didn't you say it was wisest to marry an older man? Older, yes, but... But what? Well, well, let me put it this way. I happen to be more than twice your age, and he'd even be too old for me. Age isn't everything, Aunt Rose. Robert is handsome... Generous, very intelligent, kind, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. I know, a veritable eagle scout. And most important, he's rich. Oh, no. No, I can't believe what I'm hearing. Why not, darling? You would marry for money? Absolutely. Oh, no, Velma, no. That's not how I raised you. If you can say that, then you learn nothing in my house. But I learned everything in your house, Aunt Rose. I learned how important money can be because I saw what can happen to girls who marry for love and love alone, the way you did. I saw what happens when a cheerful spirit is hemmed in by too small a house and badgered by too small a budget. Your uncle and I were deeply in love. My uncle and you were deeply in debt. Thelma, what happened to that idealistic young girl who went off to college four years ago? I grew up. Giddy, romantic love is a peculiarly American myth. Oh, really? It's because we're still a very young country. We have yet to get rid of our juvenile fantasies. Love is a fleeting, ethereal emotion. How can you base a marriage on it? How? Yes, dear, how? Marriage is a contract. And a contract should be guaranteed by some solid collateral. Very well. Very well. If you must marry for money, is, is, is he the best you can do? Oh, yes. I've explored all my options. Velma. I discovered that Robert happens to be among the wealthiest men on campus, student or faculty. He's the sole surviving member of the Hastings family. I never heard of them. They were Detroit people. Robert's father was a pioneer maker of motor cars. He was bought out by one of the big corporations for a fabulous sum of money. Oh, but there must be other wealthy men closer to your own age. Oh, Lord. Listen to how I'm talking. Yes, there are, but Robert's money is clean money. Clean? He's the only surviving member of his family. The money is all his, and when he dies, the money will be all mine. 
The others had brothers or sisters, all kinds of family complications. But Velma, do you realize in ten years Robert will be a very, very old man? Why, you'll, you'll hardly be in your thirties. I don't expect Robert to live another ten years or even five. He has a heart condition. Velma! And will be living a strenuous outdoor life in areas that aren't exactly healthy. I shall be a very young widow. And then I could afford to marry for love. Oh, Velma. Something, something has taken possession of you. Suppose five or even ten years go by and Robert is still alive. Suppose somehow he may live on to an incredibly old age. Then I suppose I'll have to burn that bridge when I get to it. Ah, there you are, Aunt Rose. Have you been waiting long? Uh, no. Were you able to see Velma at the commencement exercises? Uh, yes. She looks stunning. Don't you agree? I agree. Why do you disapprove of me? The fact that you would have to ask such a question would indicate that you couldn't possibly understand my answer. Well, why not answer anyhow? Well, first and foremost, this dramatic disparity in your ages. Why should it bother you? Because Velma is being cheated out of a young and vigorous husband. Evidently, that doesn't bother Velma. It will. Why do you suppose she wants to marry you? For my money. You're shocked. Why? I never heard of anything so cold-blooded, so... so practical. If money is so important to her, why shouldn't she marry for it? She loves me. She loves me for the security I can give her. Why do you want to marry Velma? Well, because I love her. No, 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 no. You must let me finish. I love her for the beauty and the freshness she brings into my life. Oh, it goes against all logic, all reason. I don't know what you did. Perhaps centuries ago it... It might have been called witchcraft. Such a statement is beneath you, Aunt Rose. But I cannot explain it any other way. Only ignorant people explain away what they can't understand... By witchcraft. Not everyone has your values, your attitudes, your perspective on life. You're a clever man, a convincing man. But I can't be had. I insist. You must have cast a spell over Velma. How can you be sure Velma hasn't cast a spell over me? Well, I, I, I can't be sure of anything anymore. Aunt Rose, Robert... Oh, there was such a crowd. Sorry I kept you waiting. No, I'm not. I wanted you to get to know each other. Aunt Rose, isn't he just marvelous? Tell me, Aunt Rose, what do you say now? <sighs> Bless you, my children. Well, there's a marriage for you. But uh, maybe it's not so outrageous after all. At least the principals are being honest with each other. Or do they only think they're being honest? Let's review the bidding. He wants her to be fresh and bright and beautiful. She wants him to live no longer than, say, five more years. And I want you to wait just a few moments. And then I shall return with Act Two. What is the best basis for a marriage? The question has intrigued the sages since the original introduction of men and women. It would appear, however, that the best basis is the one that works best for the individuals concerned. You have already met Professor and Mrs. Hastings, Velma and Robert, May and December. Since each had what the other wanted, shouldn't they be able to look forward to a successful marriage? It all goes back to what I said at the very beginning. What do you mean by success? Well, here's Aunt Rose to bring us up to date. And so they were married. And they left immediately on a combined honeymoon and field trip to study the customs of a remote tribe in the Amazon. At first, Velma wrote often. But a year went by, then two, three, 
four, even five. And her letters became more and more infrequent and less and less informative. And then, for a while, I didn't hear from her at all. And then one day, I received a strange, frightening letter from Brazil. Dearest Aunt Rose, save me. Please save me. You must save me. Perhaps, perhaps it is my fault. But I don't want to die. No, I must be calm. I will tell you everything. Even the part that makes me look bad. You're my only hope. You must save me. You were right. Oh, how right. It's five years. I've been married five years. I can't stand it any longer. I can't. What are they banging on those things for? It's a very interesting ceremony, my dear. I'm sure. It's called the test of the bitter water. It sounds fascinating. Are you all right? I'm fine. Are you sure? Damn it, I said I was all right. You want me to write it down and get it notarized? Obviously, something is the matter. Why can't we go home? My work is here. Why can't I go home? Home is wherever our work takes us. It's your work. Why do I have to be here? Because a wife's place is with her husband. Now, come on, we'll be late for the ceremony. Chief Araya will be insulted if we don't attend. Please convey my regrets. I have a headache. My dear, we are the honored guests. It would be an insult, and I need the chief's goodwill. That's too bad. I'm afraid it is. If I tell him you have a headache, he'll send his favorite medicine man to cure you. And that might be quite painful. And so I went with Robert. I had no desire to be sewn into a pigskin and smoked for hours to drive the evil spirits from my head. The entire tribe, hundreds of men and women were gathered about a rock from which there flowed a spring of sparkling water. All eyes were on a woman who stood alone near the spring. A woman who seemed transfixed by terror. Finally, the drums increased in intensity. And Chief Araya himself, a tall, imposing man with steel blue eyes and stark white hair, stepped forward. Let the drums be silent! What is he going to do? He's going to make her drink some spring water from that silver cup. Why is she so frightened? She's afraid the water will kill her. Is it poison? No. No, I drank it myself. Well, then why is she... She... She's been accused of infidelity. To prove her innocence, she must drink from the spring. If she is guilty, the water will kill her. But if it's not poison, how can it kill her? Well, that's what these people have believed for hundreds of years. If she's guilty, she'll die. I've seen it happen. But how can it happen? That's what we're here to study. Well, suppose she refuses to drink. That's an admission of guilt. She'd be stoned to death. Marva, daughter of Reina, wife of Corey, step forward. I accuse you of infidelity. I accuse you of disgracing your family, shaming your husband, and soiling the honor of this tribe. Do I speak truly? No. No, I... I, Shall you then submit to the test of the bitter water? Will you drink the bitter water? Please. Please leave me. Why do you avoid the test? The water is pure. See, I drink. See, my wife drinks. See, your own mother drinks. The water is pure, but only for the pure of heart. What have you to fear? 
If you are a virtuous woman... I'm innocent. Innocent. I swear to you, I am innocent. Then drink. Take the cup. Take it in your own two hands. Raise it to your lips. Drink. And now the gods will judge you. Drain the cup. Now, throw the empty cup to the ground. Immortal gods, what is your judgment? Ah! The gods have spoken. Is... is she dead? There's no doubt about it. She's dead. What do you mean I can't wear pants? I didn't say you can't. Well, what did you say? I only said Chief Araya thinks they're... Well, that they're immodest. Immodest? Why, the women in his tribe run around practically naked. It's remarkable how modesty is culturally determined. In our civilization, a woman is immodest if she exposes her body. And here a woman is immodest if she conceals it. This Chief Araya of yours is becoming a pet peeve of mine. Well, he's, a, he's a stern moralist. Almost in the mold of an Old Testament prophet. Now, how, how, how would you like to drive the jeep to Porto Sao Diego? What for? The Institute is sending me an assistant. Oh, really? A highly qualified scientist and an erudite scholar. Well, that killed it. Would you pick him up and bring him back here? I don't know, Aunt Rose. Tell me, does life get its ideas from the movies? Because he's tall and he's good-looking. And he's not old. He's young. And he's everything I've been missing and longing for in a man. Everything I thought was unimportant. How can I describe it? We're tuned in. We like so many of the same things. We can talk so easily. We like to dance. You understand, don't you? And he was even honorable. Notice I said was. Isn't it a glorious night? Uh, tell me, Dennis, have you read the Stevenson Halley analysis of the South American Indian languages? Oh, yes, sir. Do you agree? Well, I think their premise is correct, but it sheds no new light. If you boys are going to talk shop again, I think I'll turn in. But, my dear, you haven't finished your dinner. Uh, you can't go to bed yet, Velma. We have to have our dance. Uh, Professor, do you mind if I ask your wife to... Uh, Dennis... Velma, I would rather you two didn't do any more dancing. Now what's the matter? Well, it seems that this kind of thing is shocking to the natives. You can't be serious. Chief Araya spoke to me about it. Dennis, you understand. Yes, I think I do, sir. These natives are remarkably straight-laced people. You know, it's odd. Our culture sees the savage as free and unfettered. Actually, they're the prisoners of... So many taboos. So am I. Everything, everything wrong that happens from here on is my fault. All my fault. I admit it. We were walking in the forest and suddenly... Don't move. It's all right now. Just a snake. Just, just a snake. No, he wasn't going to bother you, but you disturbed him. I'm sorry I had to shoot him. Sorry? Why, the murderous thing. We do enough to destroy the balance of nature as it is. What did you say? The balance of nature, it means... I know what it means. In my own way, I've destroyed a certain balance of nature. You have? How? And in destroying it, I'm also being destroyed. Slowly. Are you... Uh... Something the matter? Hold me. Please hold me. But, uh... Closer. Closer. Thelma. We shouldn't. We should. We should. But this isn't right. Don't you want to? Yes. I want to. 
But I... Then don't talk. Oh, Dennis, Dennis. I love you, Valma. Oh, how I love you, Dennis. Well, then, let's tell Robert. Tell Robert? Are you mad? It's the honest and honorable thing to do. No. Then you can get a divorce. What are you saying? You must divorce, Robert. Why? Well, for a hundred reasons. One, you don't love him. Two, you love me. Let's wait. For what? For Robert to die. Velma. How much longer can he live? Velma, I... I can't believe you're saying this. Kiss me. No. No, it's not right. Don't you want to love me? Yes. But as my wife, marry me. How much money do you make? What kind of question is that? A very important question. Well, uh, I have a research grant for the next 36 months. How much does it pay? 8800 a year. You can't be serious. Well, why is money so important? We won't starve. Robert has money. He has over two million dollars. Think of it. Two million. Oh, well, who cares? I care. It's all going to be mine when he dies. Do you want me to throw away two million dollars? What does it matter as long as you have love in the house? It matters. It matters. He can't live forever. Oh, kiss me. <laughs> We... Don't talk. You talk too much. <laughs> Darling, you're not eating. I'm not hungry. You want to go for a walk? Well, we... We can't go for a walk now. The whole camp will know. Oh, what's the difference? Robert's asleep. I, I think he's not well. Maybe we'll be free sooner than we think. I can't believe we're having this conversation. Robert is the best friend I have in all the world. He taught me everything I know. And how do I thank him? I betray him. That's an old-fashioned word, darling. Its meaning never changes. Let's tell Robert now. I can't. I won't. Then I will. I'll swear to him it's a lie. I'll swear you wanted to seduce me. And because I refused, you're trying to... Do you know I think you would? And for you... For you... I betrayed my best friend. I even betrayed myself. Dennis! Don't look at me like that. No, Dennis. Please, no! No! Why do young girls like Velma get themselves into these situations? An extensive literature on the subject of May and December marriages exists. Indeed, a great deal has even been said on the subject on many of our own little tales here. However, the most succinct statement was uttered by Mr. Benjamin Franklin, who observed that where you have marriage without love, you will soon have love without marriage. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Straight, against the advice of her Aunt Rose, has married a man many years her senior. And way back in Act One, practically all of you were predicting what was bound to happen. Well, why shouldn't it have happened? It's what usually happens in life, isn't it? The ancient Greeks called this kind of thing fate. And it happens to more people than you would think. Yes. I betrayed myself. Do you hear, Velma? I betrayed myself. Dennis, Robert, he will hear you. Oh, yes. Robert, Robert mustn't know. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, I don't feel well. Yes, Dennis, you don't look well. Maybe you better go back to your tent. Yeah, I'll do that. Do you want me to walk with you? No, no. There are things I have to think about. Think, Dennis. 
think about us. Oh, yes. I am thinking about us. Everything will be all right soon. Yes. Soon. Everything will be just fine. Good night, Velma. Velma? Oh, did I wake you? No, no, I... I... I've been lying here thinking. Did you and Dennis talk about anything interesting at dinner? Oh, not particularly. He's quite depressed. Oh, really? Yeah, there was a job to head a research foundation, very prestigious, well-paying, and he put in for it. I didn't know that. I was amazed. I didn't think money and prestige were that important to him. He was always happy just working in the field, or so I thought. But evidently, it wasn't enough for him. The job? What about the job? He got a letter this morning. The job's been filled. Oh. What? What was that? That was a shot. Yes, Aunt Rose, it was a shot. And it came from Dennis's tent. Something said to me, don't go in there. Don't go in there. But Robert went in, and after a while, he came out. He's dead. But... I suppose the rejection by the foundation was a little too much. Oh, it's... it's horrible. I'll have to report this to the authorities. I'd hate to say it was a suicide, but... Maybe, maybe it wasn't. My dear, I know you liked him as I did. And you want to protect his name, but... Well, it's obvious. You must come down here, Aunt Rose. You must. I have no one else in the world. Only you can save my life. Help me now. I'm enclosing money for an airline ticket. You take the plane to the city of Brasilia. And then a bus to Sao Diego at the edge of the jungle. And I'll meet you there with the jeep. You must come before the 25th of the month. Please, before the 25th. Because here's what's happened. The day after we buried poor Dennis, that horrible chief, Araya, walked into the camp. Friend Robert. Chief Araya, sit Join us for some refreshment. I am not permitted to eat and drink at your table. Is there a spirit here? An evil spirit. Powerful? A spirit of death. In whose body? Hers. My wife? I make the accusation. Of what? The most disgraceful of all crimes... Adultery. How dare you? Please, my dear. Please, my dear. This filthy, disgusting, heathen, savage dares to slander me and you say, please, my dear. Uh, now, Chief, who makes this charge? I, Araya, Chief of all the forest country, make the charge. It is my duty. What right do you have? It is my right. My duty... You live in my country. You live by my law. Friend Robert, I have come in peace. Go in peace. I live in peace. What is this? What right does he have to accuse me? Oh, my poor darling. The way you dress to him... To him it suggested a wanton woman. But I... And the fact that you danced with Dennis means to him that... There... There was never anything. Anything between Dennis and me. It's untrue. We're not talking about absolute truth. We're talking about the truth as he perceives it. And this means... What? It means you'll have to take the test of the bitter water. And if I refuse, shall I be stoned to death? Darling, if you refuse, I shall lose the friendship of the chief. That's too bad. Drink the water 
And once and for all, you'll prove to the chief that you are a virtuous woman. I refuse. Come on, darling, what could happen to you? I won't, do you hear me? But why? What could happen to you? What? What are you afraid of? Well, what are you afraid of, my dear? I don't know, Aunt Rose. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. Oh, Oh, it's such beautiful comfort. It isn't. It's hot and humid, and there are flies and mosquitoes and bugs and snakes. Now, now, dear, pull yourself together. I don't know what to do. Well, if the water isn't poison, drink it. What can happen? I'm just scared. Well, then don't drink it. Then Robert loses all the years and effort he's invested in this tribe. Velma, if you are terrified by the prospect of that test, then regardless of the cost, don't take it. And if I don't, then Robert will surely divorce me. Well, that might be best for you both. Oh, no, not now. Not after these five wretched years. I I never knew how miserable a woman could be. I may have tried to tell you that a long time ago. I know. You were right. You were always right. But that doesn't help me now. Robert's visibly fading. He he can't live much longer. He has two million dollars. Velma, you must forget about the money. How can I forget? That's all I've lived for. It's my money, and I won't give it up. Well, darling, it seems your choices are obvious. Drink the water or lose the money. There must be another way. You did have an affair with Dennis? Yes. Well... Turn the jeep around and come with me. No. It's a crazy superstition of savages. I won't give up a fortune. I'll drink that water and spit in his eye. All right, then. You've decided. Thank you for seeing me, Chief Araya. You come in peace? Oh, yes, certainly. How may I serve you? You are a fine woman. Fine-looking woman. Thank you. Uh, my niece, Robert's wife. Ah. This test. It is to be tomorrow evening? Yes. Oh, it's very upsetting to her. Why? What is there to fear? She is innocent. Chief. She's not as strong as the women in your tribe. She comes from another world. You are a man of wisdom. You understand another world where customs are different. A world where women may commit adultery? No. Even your world says no. Even missionaries from your world say your God says no. But she is very upset. Why? If she is innocent, what is there to fear? Let the drums be silent. Velma, wife of Robert, I accuse you of infidelity. Do I speak truly? Answer him. No. Shall you then submit to the test of the bitter water? Yes. Here. I have filled the cup from the spring. Take it. Drink. Aunt Rose. Uh, One moment. Chief, may I drink from that cup first? Anyone who chooses may drink from the cup. All right. Well, well, nothing seems to have happened to me. Here, Velma, the water's okay. And, Rose, I don't know what to do. Velma, I have gone as far as I can. I've proved the water isn't poisoned. Now, dear, you must decide. What am I, some stupid native woman? Why am I afraid? Hand me that cup. Take the cup in your two hands. Raise it to your lips. Drink. Now the immortal gods are judging you. Throw the empty cup to the ground. 
Aunt Rosa. Phil. Uh, Phil, my boy. Uh, Child, you, you're all right. You're uh, all right. Aunt Rosa. Oh, I see Dennis. He's pointing that gun at me. He wants to kill me, too. He, he wants to take me with him. No. I don't want to die. Stop him. Uh, he wants to kill me. No. No, she isn't. She is dead. Oh, she, she can't be. She is dead. The immortal gods have spoken. <laughs> How do these things happen? We do know that people die of fright, of remorse, of all the unknown ways that silently attack the mind. Robert died a week later. The shock was obviously too great for him as well. Velma was wrong. Robert didn't have two million. He had five. And all of it went to a research foundation which is where all of it, except for a small bequest to her, would have gone anyhow. On the other hand, everything we have, we give to you. As I shall explain when I return in a few moments. The question that faced us in the beginning still confronts us here at the end. What is success? According to the poetic Mr. Thomas Gray, all that beauty and all that wealth ever gave awaits alike the inevitable hour. The paths of glory lead but to the grave. If this is true, then the only really successful creatures in this world are the worms. But if we cannot guarantee you success, we can promise you enjoyment if you tune us in seven times each week. Our cast included Jennifer Harmon, Arnold Moss, Joan Shea, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. I took my family to California on vacation. I didn't need to carry a lot of cash because I'd taken along my Citibank visa. Then, in the middle of the trip, I lost it. So I called the 800 number from Citibank. I canceled his Citibank visa and immediately issued him a new one. She got the new card to my hotel within 24 hours. If it wasn't for Citibank, the kids would have missed this new land. If you lose your visa, and it isn't from Citibank, it could be a week before you get a new one. What if that's the week you were on vacation or had to travel for business? What are you going to do then? Well, if you lose your Citibank visa and it's an emergency, we'll get a new card to you in a day. That's right, one day. Just call our toll-free number. If you want service like this from your visa... Get a Citibank visa. Look for an application in the mail or in selected magazines, stores, and restaurants. Not just visa. Citibank visa. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> Home of the great stars and the great songs. <laughs>